Koto Katsua, No My Haramaiki UFC on Sky, Koravinda Hunia. Aho. Joining me today to break down the action that we just saw on the weekend at UFC 286 and to give us a little insight into UFC 287 and Israel Adesonia's run at the title again is CKB striking coach Mike Angove. Kia ora Mike, welcome back to the show. Kia ora, good to be back on Sky. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while, but always a pleasure nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, good to be back. Hey, look, give us a little rundown. How have things been going at City Kickboxing? I know that there's a lot of training. Um, you know, Israel Desonia is obviously um, going back for a, another go at reclaiming the middleweight title. How have things been going so far? I mean, things are going well. It's a you know, pretty robust camp, as you'd expect. Uh, I expect both camps will go away and, and make some adaptions based on the first fight. Remember, it was almost five rounds, uh, four and a half rounds, really. So, uh, you know, there will be some changes, um, I think, in terms of approach. Um, I don't expect, uh, expect Pajeda, for example, to wait as long before he puts his foot on the accelerator. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some, some vulnerabilities that, that we saw there. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's where the, the focus is lying. Um, further to that, I mean, it's, it's a relatively short notice mm. uh, fight. Uh, when I say relatively, we get, you know, a, a nine to 10 week camp. We'd probably prefer a 12 week camp. Um, but it's the same for Pajera. Um, and we just uh, get on with it. Uh, obviously, this is really a legacy fight for Israel now. Um, you know, it, it, it's a significant turning point as he heads into this. Uh, you know, he's faced his, his first real defeat um, in, in the middleweight division. I know there was Jan Blahovic, but that was up challenging for a title, you know, in a heavier weight division. Uh, in this fight, he, he was knocked out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's a bit of soul searching that comes with that and, um, you know, refocusing and, and refining our tools for, for going in and, uh, you know, hopefully this time dispatching Pajeda. Does it feel a little bit different in camp with Izzy when your goal is to, you know, a little bit of redemption this time around perhaps? I think you can over-focus on that. Mm. I think at the end of the day, it's two men getting into a cage and punching each other in the head until one of them can't continue or until the judges make a decision. Mm. So, you know, obviously there is, you're now the challenger and that requires a different mindset. What I mean by a different mindset is uh, you have to understand that uh, you, you now need to take the initiative you now need to come from a place of, of want and desire, not just of defense. So it's, it's, that's a different mindset. But in terms of approach to the fight, in terms of you know, general demeanor around the camp, um, you know, nothing really changes. At the end of the day, it's a fight. Uh, Israel's had over 100 of them. Uh, collectively, as, as coaches, you know, we've had tens of thousands. So uh, we just got to get on with it. What did you make of that fight in New York? I haven't been able to um, get your um, opinion on uh, that fight in New York. What did you make of it? Um, oh, look, I mean, it was, it was clear uh, Israel was uh, was dominating a, a very closely contested fight, but he, he was well ahead on the cards, three rounds to one. Um, and, you know, sometimes fights can hinge on small moments, when he did trip after throwing that kick that breathed enough life into Pajera, it set him off a beat and enabled him to land. But you've got to remember, Alex has made a habit of doing that over the course of his career. He has uh, been a guy who could, um, you know, has come back from behind on numerous occasions. He's done that against Jason Wilness. He's done that against uh, Yuzhri Belgari. He's done that against Israel. Uh, previously when, you know, he possibly should have been stopped at the end of the second round. So here is a guy who is dangerous until after the last bell has rung. Mm. And um, we know that. And uh, he's a very, very difficult opponent. He's durable. He has one-shot power. Um, you know, he'll continue to improve his MMA game. And he's tended to do better in rematches uh, previously, you know, where he's either lost... Um, or he's been taken close. He, he's tended to, to go better and dispatch people early. So, you know, we're under no illusion what we have there. 
And, uh, you know, like I say, we, we were very close to winning that last fight, but we didn't. So now we come in with a challenger's hunger and a challenger's mentality. Do you know anything around that time frame that you mentioned about having the nine weeks, nine weeks as opposed to the preferred 12, about how this fight has come around so quickly? Um, well, the UFC at the end of the day is a business and they, uh, you know, they, they have a preference for when they want some of these fights to take place. And, you know, that's what occurred here. Um, you know, of course, you could, you've always got the option of delaying it. Um, but, you know, often with delays, there comes other complications, you know. And I think Israel certainly wanted to get in there and uh, reclaim that title without anyone uh, jumping ahead of them in the line. So that's where we're at. Yeah, fair enough. Look, when I spoke to Eugene, when he was giving me his thoughts on the fight, he said that at the end of the day, Alex Pereira won the title off of Izzy's mistakes and that if Izzy is to win the fight, he just needs a flawless five round performance. I mean, it's one thing to say that, but it's, you know, it's another thing to, to execute that in, in the octagon. But has that also been a focus as, as those little marginal errors? I mean, look, all fights are decided at that elite level. And you're talking about elite level you know you're talking about one of the greatest kickboxers of all time against one of the uh greatest mma fighters of all time mm. and um you know all fight all fights are decided on split seconds and and margins or fractions of a centimeter so you know you just have to identify those and you hope to minimize those and uh, hope that, you know, the timing doesn't coalesce when you make a mistake at the same time as, uh, you know, he's in the right position. So it's all about percentages and, and we're looking at minimising those. Yeah, absolutely. And what does the time frame look like now? Uh, April 9th isn't too far away. So what does camp look like from now till fight night? I mean, you, we, we've been here before. This is, uh, you know, we're, we're now in that tapering phase. Uh, still a little bit of hard work to do. Um, but, you know, as of next week, it will be, um, you know, tapering, refining, allowing the body to recover from what's been a pretty hard camp. Um, and, you know, just, just focusing in and, and switching on mentally. And, you know, we just take that step by step. Like, like I've said and repeated, it's not our first rodeo. We've been here before, uh, both in terms of rematching after a loss and uh, in terms of challenging for a title. It's all things that we've done before. It's just been a while. And uh, remembering that both these guys have had, you know, in excess of 100 fights, mm. you know, so that's over 200 fights experience in that ring. Um, you've got a couple of professionals just coming together. And uh, that's, that's just the approach. In New York, there seemed to have been a CKB takeover. There were so many people there from the gym. You, you saw people walking around New York everywhere. You could recognise them. What's it looking like for Miami? Is it going to be that same sort of approach? i got to be honest, I couldn't give a toss. You know, we're, <laughs> there, we're, there, for, we're there for war, excuse mm. my French, but we are. And I don't care about anyone else right now. Mm. What we care about is reclaiming the title. Um, it's great to have that support. I'm not discounting that. Um, but it's easy to get caught up and, you know, isn't this great? Isn't what a great camp? You know, look at all the support, la da di la At the end of the day, after the fight, the moment after we've hoisted the belt, that will count. Uh, right now, the focus is on we're going to war against the most dangerous opponent, uh, certainly in the middleweight division, um, and probably – you know, he would be in the top one or two in terms of absolute danger um, posed by any fighter in the UFC right now. Absolutely. Fair enough. Look, I also wanted to get your thoughts on UFC 286, Mike, because that was a pretty good card. Uh, Co-main event, Justin Gaethje um, got the win over Rafael Fazeev, and then, of course, Kamaru Usman wasn't able to recapture the welterweight title from Leon Edwards. But the lightweight division, I know you, you know, there's connections there with Rafael Fazeev and CKB, and, of course, he's fought um, a lot of our um, Anzac fighters in the past. So what were your thoughts on Gaethje and Fazeev? Look, I was surprised, actually, Gaethje managed to pull that out. I've got to be honest, I thought Fazeev is a better technical fighter. Mm. 
Um, you know, it, it was a very good fight. It was well contested. Uh, you know, I, I think Gaethje, along with being very powerful, he's a little bit unorthodox. And I think that just caught uh, Rafa a little bit on the hop. Um, you know, I think he needed to put together one or two more punches. And there were key moments in that fight where he just needed to steal some points back. Um, also, Gaethje hits hard, mm. you know, and sometimes that can just put you off a misstep. Um, Gaethje's always dangerous. Uh, this, for him, was very much a, a last-chance kind of saloon. He wants to have another title run. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of desperation on the line for him. And yet again, he's managed to turn aside the challenge of a, of a young guy and a very good young guy. Um, so Rafa will just need to go back. He'll need to have a look at, at what he did in that fight and just uh, how he can offset it. But that said, very good fight. Very, very closely contested. There's no question that Rafa deserves to be in the top five. Mm. And that is, you know, one of the most uh, talent-rich divisions in the sport. So, you know, he's right there or thereabouts. It's it's only 0.2 of a percent. It's only a couple of punches uh, towards the end of a couple of rounds that would make the difference in changing that decision. Yeah, he's an absolutely um, exciting talent for the future, that's for sure. And this won't be his only chance to run to the top. Justin Gaethje, as you mentioned, is making his final run. What would your thoughts be on a fight between him and Islam Makachev? Um, Islam can be hurt. Um, you know, when he's fighting defensively and he, he's allowed to fight at his own rhythm, um, he, he fights very, very well. Um, but he can be hurt. I don't think he's got the world's greatest chin. Mm. Um, and, you know, Gaethje can hit anyone on the chin. That said, uh, Mahachev's, um, his grappling game is very, 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 very good. Um, Gaethje has had pretty good takedown defense. Um, and we know he's got good lead kicks as well um, and good power. But, you know, um, Obviously, Habib just wrapped him up quicker than the blink of an eye. And Mahachev, I'm not sure he has the same finishing ability of, of Habib on the ground, but I think if it goes to ground, um, you know, Justin's going to struggle a little. Uh, I, I think he's a different kind of fighter from uh, Volkanovski, who, who, who we saw, you know, give Mahachev uh, some problems. But even Alex had, had to put up with uh, Islam on his back for an entire round. So, you know, um, that there's some clear and present danger signs there. But Gaethje is capable on his day of, uh, of hurting anyone. And even Habib, um, you know, he was absolutely feeling those lead kicks. I know he had a broken foot, but, you know, he knew that he had to put him away. Otherwise, uh, he might have been in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. He is, a, he is a big threat, so it'll be interesting to see uh, Gaethje's journey from here on in. And let's go to that main event, welterweight title fight. Leon Edwards, Kamaru Usman, Kamaru, of course, coming up short in the end. Did anything about that fight surprise you at all? To be honest, no. <laughs> um, I, thought, I think people fa failed to factor in a couple of things. One is altitude, where the last fight was fought. Uh, Kamaru was there early and was well accustomed to altitude. Uh, Leon Edwards wasn't. Uh, so that's the first thing. Leon started the round very well in the first fight, um, but then proceeded just to be walked down uh, through two, three, and four. Um, so in that respect, we didn't see uh, quite what Leon is, is capable of with, uh, with a decent gas tank. So this fight in London, it was obviously in his own environment, uh, he wasn't facing uh, higher altitude, which means which meant he, he had full use of his gas tank. And he also made a couple of adaptions. There were knees up the middle. Mm. Um, he shifted well. Um, we knew that uh, Kamara would be worried about the head kick. So he threw a few of those, but then he varied the left leg to the body. Uh, to the lead leg with the inside thigh kick and every now and then throwing something up high. And he kept Kamaru turning. Now, Kamaru's game's based on pressure 
He can hit very hard. He's pretty durable. He's pretty defensively responsible, but he's not the quickest spider in the world. And he's a little bit methodical, particularly if you can keep him on the outside. So we've seen that from, you know, fights against Colby Covington. Colby actually landed more shots, mm. but Kamari just hits harder, um, you know, and, and hurt him. Uh, we've seen him be able to be hit from the outside by a quicker fighter, be able to be hit by a guy who's catching him on the turn. Um, and that's what Leon did. He did that really well. Plus, of course, you have to be able to deal with the takedowns. So it was just the right fighter. Styles make fights. And, um, you know, it was still a pretty close fight. Mm. It could very well have been 2-2 going into that fifth round. Um, most people probably had it 3-1, but it was still pretty closely contested. Um, as I say, small margins of error. And, um, you know, Leon, in my mind, um, you know, really closed out the show. And, um, you know, he's proved himself that that was his 12th victory in a row. But well, that's no fluke, um, you know, and the, and the butt hurts online who, are, you know, uh, sort of decrying his efforts aren't looking at who he's beaten on the way up. Mm. Um, you know, you don't win 12 times in a row in the UFC uh, if, you know, by accident. It's not a fluke that the guy's there. It wasn't even a fluke that he landed the head kick in the first fight. You know, that was a well-drilled, well-set-up, well-executed technique. So, you know, um, you know, Leon did really, really well. And uh, he's a deserved champion. Um, and he performed uh, against a guy who, you know, is, is one of the, the best of all time. So you can't argue with that. So superb performance from the, from the man from the UK. Yeah, and he appears to now want Jorge Masvidal, who's, of course, the co-main event for 287 up against... Gilbert Burns, but it appears that the UFC are trying to tee him up, Leon Edwards up with Colby Covington. What do you think would be would be the fight in that instance? Um, for a start, I think Bilal uh, has earned the right to fight, Bilal Muhammad. Um, I don't know why he's not getting a chance. Well, I do, actually. He's probably considered a little bit boring. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think he... he uh, should realistically be right up in that, that conversation. But we know that both Jorge and Colby sell pay-per-views. Mm. Jorge needs to get past Gilbert. That's the first thing, you know. Um, it may not be as easy as he thinks. So, uh, But Gilbert can be hit and hurt, and we know Jorge's a decent striker. So let's see how that one goes. But uh, Jorge, if, if he ends up going to ground, then we could have some problems. Um, Colby, I mean, look, the only guy to beat him um, has been Usman. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you can't really argue with, with that. So I agree he's still in contention. Um, and people like him because he's got that ridiculous persona that he, that he puts on. I mean, you know, he's a snake oil salesman. That's all he is. Um, but he's also a great athlete who's a snake oil salesman. So uh, let him sell the, sell the snake oil to the masses and get them in. And, um, you know, he offers something different too. It'll be Southpaw versus Southpaw. Uh, Leon will lose some of that left kick availability, um, you know, because you have to be a little more cautious throwing that, that left kick to a fellow Southpaw. So that will be interesting as well. The other thing is Colby has a relentless gas tank. So that's, it's going to be a, a very, very interesting bout if that one ends up taking place. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite interesting to see how a change of title can ignite a division, right? So it'd be very interesting to see uh, who gets that next shot. And Mike, you were also present at King in the Ring the weekend just gone. And of course, we saw Nikora Lee Kingi claiming the 62 kg title for the third time. What did you make of the vibe there and that event in particular? Yeah, so look, I, I think firstly, we need to acknowledge King in the Ring's place in New Zealand and the job done by Jason and Anna Sati. Mm. Um, you know, they don't get a hell of a lot of reward for the show that over the last decade has single-handedly provided the platform to, to propel some of our leading fighters into the UFC and on bigger stages. You know, that, that includes Glory. That includes, uh, to an extent, Bellator and one. Mm. Um, that, that includes, you know, world championships with different sanctioning bodies. Um, and that's before we start to talk about the number of champions that have gone on to the UFC, and that would be four. Um, in fact, I think it may even be five. So, you know, without that show, 
the current renaissance we're enjoying in New Zealand doesn't happen. So uh, just a big shout out and taitoko to um, Jason Anna for what they do. Back to the, the fight itself, um, probably the best event I've been to in an incredibly long time. Started off a little slow, but then all of a sudden there were knockouts coming from everywhere. And a uh, big shout out to a couple of 19-year-olds who just produce some hellacious knockouts um, and, and really pushed. Um, our, our talent pool in New Zealand is great when you, come, when you have a couple of 19-year-olds just come up and uh, set aside guys who, who are a little older and a lot more experienced. I mean, that was superb. Lucas McAdam in the final uh, really pushed Nick Corder. Mm. Uh, he showed something because he got rocked early. Um, you know, and he got dropped for an eight count early, and then he dropped Nikora. Nikora missed uh, a right uppercut, got counted with a with a with a right hand, and Nikora was on rubber leg street for a while. Uh, and it was such a superb fight, and it, it could have been very much in the balance. It was to and fro. Nikora's experience really got him through, and then he managed to land the spinning back kick like right in the final one or two seconds of the fight. I mean, you don't get any more that dramatic than that unless you're talking about Leon Edwards <laughs> knocking out Camaro and you know in the final 30 seconds of their title fight so it was, it was superb and I think what you have to credit is um, also Nick Corder in the semi-final got hit by a massive right hand he dropped he clattered his head off the canvas and he rose from the dead like Tyson Fury did against Deontay <laughs> the ability to do that sustain a 10-8 round, then come back and win the fight by stoppage in the third is massive. You know, he had to quell two young underdogs who weren't experienced in, in tasting defeat and, um, and and come back through adversity to, to claim the third title. So that was superb. Um, it really was. A um, couple of good women's fights on the show as well. Michelle Preston came up short in her fight against Ramirez, the Mexican. Um, you know, but at 44 years of age, mother, company director, um, you know, uh, yeah, international boxing champion, four-time kickboxing champion of the world. Um, you know, you got you got to say, wow, you know, she's pretty awesome. Um, and uh, Wendy Talbot, Michaela Jenkins, they were on there again, you know, having another war between those two. Um, so, look, it, it was a show which had something for everyone, um, you know, topped off by Nakora taking the three-peat, which is something only, only um, Israel Adesanya has managed to do before. So, you know, it, it was pretty impressive. And um, if you are a combat sports fan or if you just like to see a little bit of excitement, uh, that's the show you, sh you should check into. Whānau, UFC 287 is just around the corner, April 9th. Don't miss it, Israel Adesanya making another run to the middleweight title up against Alex Pereira in Miami. But this weekend, head over to ESPN on Sunday for Vera versus Sandhagen. The UFC returns with a clash of top 10 Bantamweights on the hunt for his fifth consecutive victory. Huge head kick from Vera. Marlon Chito Vera looks to turn back the dangerous finishing skills of former interim title challenger, Corey the Sandman Sandhagen. Don't miss UFC Fight Night. Vera versus Sandhagen, live on ESPN.